Hello, I'm Sandra Lavene. Hello, I'm Omar Serrano. Hello, I'm Tim Buta. What motivated our project is the observation that the debates on the power transitions paid relatively little attention to the conditions under which governments gain regulatory influence in international regimes. That is the power to shape the contents of international rules and to propose new ones to which then other countries concede, including the old traditional regulatory hegemons like the EU and the US. Inspired by the literature on the projection of EU rules beyond borders and regulatory cooperation in transgovernmental networks, we identified two key preconditions for the transition to regulatory leadership. Firstly, regulatory capacity, and secondly, regulatory capabilities. The analysis of how states acquire regulatory capacity and capabilities internationally demands first to understand how these assets develop, develop domestically in national political administrative systems. Also, these assets can differ strongly across policy sectors and issue areas. This is why, in addition to a few large and quantitative studies, our special issue is based on detailed and mostly comparative case studies by specialists of the respective issue area and country. To understand the dynamics that Sandra just sketched for you, we develop in the introductory essay to the special issue, an original theoretical framework, which we call the power transition theory of global economic governance. It builds on power transition theory, which defines power transition as a major, often abrupt shift in the distribution of power among nations. Underpinning this is a resource conception of power. Specifically, power transition theory typically posits that the country's power is a function of its population, its degree of industrialization and thus productivity, as well as the effective and efficient political institutions that it has. Now, Organsky and most uh, contributors to the traditional power transition theory have tended to assume that power transitions inherently result in conflict because A, rising powers seek, as Organsky put it in 1958, a new place for themselves in international society, a place to which they feel their growing power entitles them. And secondly, because the existing institutions reflect the established power's dominant role. That role is entrenched in those institutions, in the patterns and rules for diplomacy, trade, and war. As a consequence, power transition theory traditionally assumes not just irreconcilable differences and therefore conflicts of interest, but even the potential for such conflicts of interest to escalate into militarized conflict or even war. Now, we offer three critiques and thereby extensions of power transition theory. Like traditional power transition theory, we assume that a change in resources amounts to a change in relative power, thereby making what Morse and Cohen have called contested multilateralism more likely. However, we point out that having influence in global economic governments means the ability to affect others at a minimum having spoiler potential, which requires in this realm having a strong regulatory state understand what we mean by that, we distinguish between regulatory capacity, which is all about implementation and enforcement ability, and regulatory capability, a notion that draws ultimately on the work of Nussbaum and Sen, as presented in the regulatory policy realm, especially in the special issue in regulation governance by Kafaji and Pizzo from 2015. This emphasizes the ability of countries to come up with their own solution to the problems that they face, given the particular situation they find themselves in. We see these two dimensions of the regulatory state as being related to each other in such a way that we can derive from it the common um, notion of the institutional strength of the regulatory state. This is one of the key variables in our framework. We point out that developing strong regulatory states, that is regulatory capacity and capability, is ultimately a political choice, which to understand requires an analysis of the domestic politics. The second critique 
uh, we have is of the assumption of traditional power transition theory that the state is unitary and power resources are highly fungible. This assumption we reject. Instead, we argue that the pertinent expertise and resources needed for regulatory capacity and capability are issue specific, often not very fungible at all, such that the regulatory state is disaggregated. It's possible for a country to have a high level of capacity and capability in one real realm and a low level in another. Theoretical models, as well as empirical analyses, therefore must allow for this kind of variation by issue area. Third, traditional power transition theory argues that self-interested behavior leads to power transitions resulting inherently in conflicts of interest. This claim we modify. We recognize that it is high potential for conflicts of interest, but we also point out that the existing rules that serve the interests of the established powers need not inherently be detrimental to the interests of rising powers. That as rising powers become more similar to the established powers, their preferences may converge. As a consequence, the need for issue-specific analyses of actual substantive preferences arises, preferences that are not assumed to be structurally determined, but a function of both international and domestic politics. As a consequence, we come to the expectation that when the institutional strength of the regulatory state is low and preference divergence is low, emerging powers remain rule takers, weakly supportive of the existing regulatory regime, but also relatively marginal to it. When preference divergence is high, but the institutional state remains weak, countries can only become rule fakers, resentful, possibly sham rule takers. Where preference divergence remains low or becomes low, and the institutional strength of the regulatory state rises, we get rule promoters. Now, when both the institutional strength of the regulatory state and preference divergence is high, the outcome will depend on a third factor. To the extent that the preferences of the rising powers are accommodated by the established powers, we will expect the newly emerging power to then become rule makers, transforming the regime, but maintaining a single coherent global regulatory regime in the process. By contrast, if their preferences are not accommodated, we would expect the emerging power to become a rule breaker or a spoiler, effectively undermining the existing regime. Our framework those, uh, thus expects uh, variance in outcomes across countries over time and by issue area. For this reason, uh, the papers in this special issue look at the BRICS, especially China, India, and Brazil, but also at middle powers such as Mexico, South Korea, and Turkey. They look at a variety of trade-related regulatory issue areas, antitrust or competition policy, expert credit governance, intellectual property protection, labor mobility, and public procurement. First paper does a statistical analysis uh, looking at the degree of divergence amongst the set of countries from the current rules governing uh, the global economy. The study by Simon Evanet shows that there's significant uh, divergence in the institutional strength that you can see here at the y-axis, but also in terms of their preferences, which is reflected on the x-axis. Uh, you can also see that there's significant divergence amongst the BRICS themselves. Three papers look at competition policy. One of them by Wang Lei shows that Brazil starts essentially as a weakly supportive rule taker. And as it develops its regulatory capacity and capability, mainly through its participation in the international competition network, it becomes a rule promoter. Its preferences converge with those of the existing regime. China, on the other hand, is a much uh, later uh, comer to this regime in 2007. And hence, um, its strengthening of, of regulatory capacity starts already with, with certain divergence vis-a-vis uh, -vis the regime. Interestingly, it does not strengthen its regulatory capacity and capability through multilateral means as Brazil, but 
through bilateral means. Thus, it is possible that China might play a role either as a regime transforming or regime undermining actor. When we look at public procurement, another one of the papers in the special issue, Ivo Krisic actually shows that there are two main components of this regime. On the one hand, a soft component, which has to do with transparency. And here, India, Brazil, and China have all not only strengthened the regulatory state, but have tended to converge with existing rules, mainly because of shared concerns about corruption. On the other hand, when it comes to the hard component of the regime, as Krisic notes, uh, market access, the three countries have very divergent preferences. And hence, they stay on the rule faker category and move towards the spoiler category. Together with Mira Buri, we'll look at uh, health and intellectual property rights, where India and Brazil start already with a significant divergence to the existing uh, regime. And what we see is that as they build the regulatory capacity and capability, they move towards either regime transforming actors or regime undermining. Brazil, however, does so less than India because it has a split regulatory state due to domestic contestation. India, on the other hand, not only is able to strengthen its regulatory state, but is able to get other countries as a result to follow its policies. And it is to an extent accommodating by the existing powers, thus becoming a rule maker. Finally, we'll look at the case of export credit governance in China. Um, Kristen Hopewell shows that in this case, China has fundamentally divergent preferences to the existing regime. And hence, its rapid strengthening of regulatory capacity and capability leads to it to become a spoiler, thus undermining the existing regime. Jointly, the papers in this special issue show that the rise of new powers in the global economy is truly transformative. It need not, however, result in conflict or in a breakdown in global regulatory regimes. The consequences for global economic governance depend upon political choices, both of the rising and the established powers. It depends specifically on the decision whether to invest in building a stronger regulatory state, and it depends on the specific issue-specific policy preferences of the rising powers. <laughs>